Welcome to Reasonable Doubts, your skeptical guide to religion. Welcome to Reasonable Doubts, the radio show and podcast for those who won't just take things on faith. This is Justin Schieber. My fellow Doubtcasters, Jeremy, Dave, and Luke, will not be joining me today because this RD Extra is a debate, a debate on a very contentious and sensitive issue, abortion. While not a topic directly related to religion, there is, of course, no denying that abortion rights continue to be a matter of of heated debate at the intersection of religion and American politics. Uh, And so we thought that our listeners might benefit from this exchange. We're debating the question, is abortion murder? My opponent, John Barron, is arguing in the affirmative. John is the author of a blog named Sifting Reality. This can be found at siftingreality.com. There, John blogs about politics, philosophy, same-sex marriage, atheism, Christianity, and religion in general. And most relevant to this debate, he blogs about abortion. And he does all of this from a conservative Christian perspective. Now, the format is as follows. Each of us will give a 15-minute opening statement, with John going first. Uh, In our opening statements, of course, we will present our case for our respective positions on the topic of debate. Uh, Then we will do a round of 10-minute rebuttals. After that, a round of 5-minute closing statements. This debate isn't a live debate. Over the last few weeks, John and I have been emailing each other our audio clips. John would email his opening statement to a specified length in audio form to me, and I would spend a week at my own convenience scripting my reply before sending it back to him. And this would, of course, go back and forth until the debate was completed. Now, the hope was obviously to put the focus on the arguments and their carefully scripted replies rather than on one's ability to think on their feet. Uh, This seemed to be a far better way to approach uh, an issue as serious as this one. As always, if you have any feedback, visit our blog at doubtcast.org. And we will be back soon with new episodes of Reasonable Doubts in just a few weeks. So without further delay, here is John Barron with his opening statement to answer the question, is abortion murder? Hello. First, I'd like to thank Justin for extending the invitation of this debate. I agreed for a couple of reasons. First, this is a topic I'm very passionate about. And two, despite being on opposite ends of a few issues, I know Justin to be a charitable and amicable ideological opponent. Uh, I think the answer to uh, this question, is abortion murder, is a very important one to get right. And before I make my case that elective abortion is in fact murder, I'd like to make a few clarifications. Briefly, here's what the debate is not about. It is not about a woman's right to choose. It's not about how many women and their doctors would be tried for murder. After all, people who murder ought to be tried for it, regardless of how many it is. Uh, The debate is not about whether or not abortion is currently the law of the land. Uh, We can all think of laws which we believe might be immoral or ought to be illegal. Uh, Lastly, it's not about every kind of abortion. It's about a very specific kind, and uh, more on that in just a moment. No, the, uh, the important factors are these. When does life begin? What is the unborn? And finally, what is an abortion and what does it actually do? First, we need to make sure we're all talking about the same thing when we use the terms abortion and murder. Specifically, I think we're talking about elective abortion here. An elective abortion is one which isn't medically necessary to save the life of the mother. Uh, An abortion to save the mother's life isn't designed for taking the life of the child per se. Its primary purpose is preserving the mother's life, and the child's death is is really an unfortunate consequence. Murder is the intentional, unjustified taking of human life. For the most part, this is a very uncontroversial definition, and really only becomes controversial when the discussion shifts to abortion. 
What becomes cloudy is uh, whether or not to use the term human or person in this, in this discussion. I think the shift from human being to person is, frankly, it's a rhetorical trick, in my opinion. Uh, it provides refuge in muddled, fluid, and arbitrary terms. Uh, those who would push for personhood language will usually provide lists of uh, qualifications that would transition one from being a mere human being into a person. Uh, consciousness, for example, being self-aware, uh, the ability to act beyond instinct, having motives or goals, for example. Temporal projection, uh, the ability to look toward the future or reflect in the past. Uh, capability of reactionary emotion, understanding and awareness of love, hope, anger. The ability to appreciate beauty and art, for example. Uh, the real problem with personhood lists of qualifiers is they're utterly arbitrary. Uh, everyone has their own lists uh, with similarities and differences, and no one has any transcendent authority to impose their list of qualifiers on other people. Uh, they, sure, they might be useful guidelines for what might be a person, but uh, nothing necessitates the particular traits on any one person's lists. Uh, conditions for personhood can be included or removed depending on whoever is making the list, or in this case, who you need to fail the test. Uh, personhood demands, I think they beg the question, and they're based merely on asserting definitions. It's these definitions that are exactly what's up for debate. Why these particular traits? Who says so? And to what degree does someone need them to achieve in order to be protected? All personhood properties are held in degree. Uh, people have different levels of consciousness, intuition, psychological maturity, etc. Uh, it stands to reason that since no one holds equal degrees of any particular psychological state or personhood attributes, then not everyone are equal persons. That's if, of course, personhood is as important to the right to life as it's presented. Another problem is that personhood lists also disqualify newborns and some impaired adults from the right to life. Differentiating between newborns and impaired adults, uh, it begs the question and it reeks of special pleading. In fact, it can't be done without an inconsistency. For example, exemptions are made all the time for people who are sleeping or under anesthesia or otherwise unconscious. All these psychological states are personhood disqualifiers. Uh, but any special exemption for these people actually undermines the argument that they're required for personhood and protection altogether. Uh, these humans that lack the personhood attributes, they don't meet the qualifications, but they're protected nonetheless. Uh, these exemptions, they show that the qualities are not truly what qualifies somebody for protection. Rather, it's some outside standard that people are using other than personhood qualities that are being applied to them in order to protect them. The truth is, the only thing human beings hold equally is their human nature. They are equal because of the kinds of things they are, not the kinds of things they could do. Uh, reflection on this point should make it obvious. If there are two or more people standing in a line, what could you point to in order to show that they are equally valuable and that they may not be killed at will? Is it their size or their shape or how many limbs they have? Do we give them a psychological exam before determining if one or any of them can be killed? To me, it seems very disingenuous to require that an immature human being possess the attributes of a mature human being or else risk being aborted. No, uh, we understand that the people in this line, that regardless of their physical or psychological development, are worthy of not having their lives taken at will precisely because of the kinds of things they are. They are a human being, a member of the human family. And this is why the abortion debate must be argued in terms of human beings and not hu persons. Okay, so can we know when life begins? Despite 
that some abortion defenders may object and even claim that this is somehow up for debate, embryologists and biologists, they don't debate this issue, medically speaking. According to Dr. Alfred Bongiani, who was the professor of pediatrics and obstetrics at the University of Pennsylvania, when he testified to the Subcommittee on Separation of Powers to the Senate Judiciary Committee S-158 during the 97th Congress, first session, 1981, he stated, I have learned from my earliest medical education that human life begins at the time of conception. I submit that human life is present throughout this entire sequence from conception to adulthood and that any interruption at any point throughout this time constitutes a termination of human life. I am no more prepared to say that these early stages represent an incomplete human being than I would be to say that the child prior to the dramatic effects of puberty is not a human being. This is human life at every stage, end quote. That same report concluded, quote, Physicians, biologists, and other scientists agree that conception marks the beginning of the life of a human being, a being that is alive and a member of the human species. There is overwhelming agreement on this point in countless medical, biological, and scientific writings, unquote. Even an entry in WebMD notes, quote, at the moment of fertilization, your baby's genetic makeup is complete, including its sex. Within 24 hours after fertilization, the egg begins dividing rapidly into many cells, end quote. Keith Moore, in his textbook, The Developing Human, Clinically Oriented Embryology, the 7th edition, in 2003, on pages 2 and 16, quote, a zygote is the beginning of a new human being. Birth is merely a dramatic effect during development resulting in a change of environment. Human development begins at fertilization, the process during which a male sperm unites with a female ovum to form a single cell called a zygote. This highly specialized cell marks the beginning of each of us as a unique individual. Also, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in, uh, in the National Geographic in 2005, an issue titled In the Womb, quote, the two cells gradually and gracefully become one. This is the moment of conception when an individual's unique set of DNA is created, a human signature that never existed before and will never be repeated. End quote. So we do know when life begins, and we know what exists at the point of conception, a genetically complete living human being. Admittedly, we don't have a human being that looks fully mature, but then again, why should we, look, why should we expect it to look fully mature when it isn't? Its life has just begun. Medically speaking, a fertilized egg is not a potential life. It is alive already, and this is evidenced by some of the biological functions which begin immediately. Uh, for example, the outer layer of the egg changes composition to prevent additional sperm from entering the egg. Uh, the rapid cell division, etc. Et uh, biological function is only possible if life is present. Furthermore, DNA determines what a living thing actually is. At the point of fertilization, there is a complete sequence of DNA, and at no time in our development will we gain any additional genetic information. From the point of conception, the fertilized egg is, is genetically complete and human. And this is not a potential human either. It's only a potential embryo, a potential fetus, a potential infant, a potential toddler, a potential adolescent, a potential teenager, and a potential adult. In other words, it's fully human and potentially mature. But maturity doesn't determine value either. Consider a 10-year-old girl whose reproductive system that isn't as biologically mature as a 17-year-old. She's not any less valuable and she's not any less human. A human being is value in virtue of being a member of the human family. The only difference between a fertilized egg and a fully grown adult is just the degree of maturity. So finally... 
what is an abortion and what does it do? Uh, for the sake of the audience, I will forego the grisly details of an abortion procedure, unless this is up to the, up for debate. Uh, but Planned Parenthood describes an abortion as uh, the most common, actually, uh, an aspiration abortion, in which the opening of the cervix is stretched with dilators, basically a series of increasingly thick rods, or absorbent dilators are inserted a day or a few hours before the procedure, and uh, this slowly stretches open the cervix. A tube is inserted, and finally, either a handheld suction device or a suction machine empties the uterus. Either what, however you want to describe it, a live developing human being in the womb is removed, and in plain language, abortion takes the life of a developing human being in the womb. So, what are some of the reasons that women give to have an abortion? Uh, according to the Guttmacher Institute, some of the most common reasons are having a baby would dramatically change her li a woman's life. Uh, it would interfere with an education or career. Uh, she already has dependents or other children. She can't afford a baby or child care now. Uh, she's unmarried. She can't afford the basic, her basic needs, and she's on financial assistance or welfare. She's unemployed. Uh, she can't leave a job to take care of a baby. She'd have to find a new place to live. Uh, she has a lack of support from her husband or partner. Uh, her husband or partner is unemployed. She doesn't want to be a single mother. Or uh, she's having relationship problems. Uh, she and her partner don't want to get married. Or the marriage might break up soon. Uh, the husband or partner is abusive to her or her children. Uh, she's done having children. Uh, she doesn't want people to know she got pregnant. Or she doesn't feel mature enough to raise a child. Or she doesn't or her, she is being pressured by parents or her husband or partner to have the abortion. So, by far, the majority of women who do have an abortion, they have them for reasons other than preserving their own lives, and overwhelmingly for what I would consider matters of convenience. Certainly not for reasons which would justify taking a, uh, an innocent human being who wasn't in a uterus. Uh, said another way, if the reason wouldn't justify taking the life of a post-birth human being, it shouldn't justify taking the life of a pre-birth human being. Thank you. I want to thank my opponent, John Barron, for agreeing to participate in this debate with me and for his thoughtful and impassioned opening statement. I hope this debate will prove to be challenging and informative for the both of us and hopefully to anyone listening in. I won't be addressing any of his points in my opening statement. Rather, I will be arguing for my own position. The topic we agreed on is, is abortion murder? No doubt this will seem like a silly and even offensive question to some, while others will find this to be a fair description of what they see as one of the most horrific things a person can do. The core issue here is the permissibility of abortion, because we both already agree that there is such a thing as permissibility and impermissibility, so that is not what is up for debate. We also both agree that murder is, by definition, impermissible. And so we must try to settle the status of abortion if we are to claim it counts as murder. But is there any way to solve our disagreement on abortion rationally without uh, the use of pictures of dead fetuses or insisting that a woman's right to make choices is the only relevant factor in our moral equations? If I didn't think that the answer to this question was yes, I would not have agreed to this exchange. It is important to recognize that an explanatory account, either explicitly or implicitly, for what we hold as morally wrong about killing in uncontroversial cases must be the starting point. Because it is only once we establish such a framework that we can hold abortion, which is the topic of the disagreement, up to that light to see how it fares. And so, in this debate, I have two goals. First, I want to present a quick, plausible, general account to explain what instances of killing that are clearly morally wrong all have in common. 
to explain the wrongness of instances of killing that just seem very clearly wrong. Second, I want to argue that according to my account of the wrongness of killing in instances that are clearly morally wrong, abortion is morally permissible in the vast majority of cases, and in those cases at least, abortion is not murder. The moral status of abortion is a complicated issue in applied ethics, and it's an issue that demands our serious consideration. Any attempt at a resolution of the issue by by the way that we usually engage in moral discourse, which would be uh, appealing to general moral principles, uh, that's not going to be so easy in this situation. So in order to flesh out an account of the wrongness of, of the instances of killing that are clearly morally wrong, it seems that a question could be asked. What is that property that is common to all instances of killing that are clearly morally wrong? First, it seems clear that after a survey of varied instances of killing that are clearly morally wrong, that moral relevance is related in some fundamental way to the possession of desires. And not just desires that are currently entertained as active thoughts, but desires nonetheless. So this distinction between desires that are active thoughts that one is currently entertaining and desires in a more background sense can be very helpful. So let's refer to these two species of desire as currently entertained desire and background desire. So think of a man who wants to justify his cheating behind his wife's back. If what only counts morally is whether or not a specific act frustrates a currently entertained desire, then it seems that he could say that his cheating is permissible because at the time he was cheating, his wife was not currently entertaining her desire that her husband stay faithful. Such an account, of course, by itself would fail to properly explain the wrongness of this act. What matters morally, it seems, is the presence of his wife's strong background desire that her husband stay faithful, regardless of the fact that she was not currently entertaining it at that moment. This distinction is also important because a temporarily comatose adult has desires, but not currently entertained desires. And because ending the life of a temporarily comatose adult is, is prima facie wrong, any account that only talks of currently entertained desires as the reason for the wrongness of killing would be very weak on explanatory power and should be dismissed for its implausibility. So I've given us reason to think that an account for the wrongness of instances of killing that are clearly morally wrong should require the existence of a background desire in an individual. However, there is another morally relevant distinction that I think needs to be made, and that is between the actual content and the idealized content of one's desires. People's desires are often formed under unfortunate circumstances, like having inaccurate or incomplete information, or perhaps a sudden tragedy that leads one to temporarily be unable to keep priorities in order, or to think calmly and rationally about their expectations or what uh, or probable future experiences. So remember the man looking for justification to cheat on his wife. Let's imagine that his wife's best friend gets stricken with a fatal disease, and as a result, his wife plunges into a deep depression, and while in a fit of despair, she confides in another close friend and says something like, All I care about is that Sally survives this. I could care less if my husband is sleeping all over town. Now, in her present state, as she is saying that, she really means it. It seems that the husband could appeal to the fact that she currently has no desire that he stay faithful, not a background desire or a currently entertained desire. But such an account, of course, by itself would fail to explain the wrongness of this act. What seems to matter morally here is the idealized content of one's desires, not merely their actual content. So when I say that a person possesses an ideal desire for X, I really mean that the contents of that person's desire is X once it is corrected for the less than perfect circumstances in which it was formed. So remember that question that I asked earlier. What is that property that is common to all instances of killing that are clearly morally wrong? I want to claim that that property is the actual possession of a most fundamental desire, 
an ideal background desire for a future like ours. And so the wrongness of killing is not just wrong because it thwarts a desire, but it thwarts an extremely important desire, a desire to preserve a future like ours. Now that I have given what I think is a plausible general account for why killing is wrong, how does abortion fare when it is held up to that light? To answer the question, we need to look at something my account requires before it can be used with any real results on the issue of abortion. Notice that my account for why killing is wrong does depend on our ability to attribute background desires to individuals. But how exactly do we go about attributing background desires to individuals? An individual with background desires would, of course, not only need a brain, but it would need a functioning brain. The human fetus does not have conscious experience until it has a brain capable of organized activity in its cerebral cortex. And all this is needed before a fetus is even capable of having desires. If what I'm saying is true, then it follows that a human fetus becomes a person at a certain point in fetal development and not at conception, as my opponent argues. In Jeff McMahon's 2002 book, The Ethics of Killing, Problems at the Margins of Life, he writes, It is not known with certainty at what point during gestation the fetal brain develops the capacity to generate consciousness. Most neurologists accept that the earliest point at which consciousness is even possible is around the 20th week of pregnancy, when the synaptic connections begin to form along the cortical neurons. It's, however, unlikely that consciousness becomes possible until after another month, that is, until around the sixth month. Neurologist Julius Corrine offers a representative sketch of the relevant aspects of fetal brain development. He says, neurons in the cortical plate first begin to form cortical synapses at about 20 weeks. These neurons then form synaptic connections between the intercerebral structures such as the thalamus and the brainstem, resulting in sensory reception and more, um, <clears throat> and more patterned spontaneous and induced motor activity. Cortical EEG activity can be first recorded at about 21 to 22 weeks after fertilization. The blink startle response with eyes opening to auditory stimuli can be demonstrated at 24 weeks, and cortical sensory evoked potentials appear at about 25 to 27 weeks. Major components of function, including aspects of consciousness, are unequivocally present in the fetus after 28 weeks of fetal age. The onset of fundamental core brain function can be identified between the limits of about 20 to 28 weeks. And regarding the onset of organized cortical brain activity, there is no evidence to even suggest that this appears prior to the 25th week of gestation. Now, if we want to proceed with the utmost caution <clears throat> on these subjects that I think we must, we are going to want to place the marker prior to the onset of this activity. So let's say 24 weeks. This should allow for certain irregularities in development. Our main question then is, at what developmental stage do abortions usually happen? Well, according to the Guttmacher Institute, roughly 1.5% of abortions in the United States occur after the 20th week of pregnancy, which means that under my account, the vast majority of abortions do not happen to human persons with a right to life and are therefore not murder. So again, according to a plausible account of why killing is wrong in those most uncontroversial cases, abortions are not murder in the vast majority of cases because these are not killings of persons in the vast majority of cases. This, of course, does not mean that all abortions performed after this point are necessarily impermissible and therefore murder. There, of course, may be other concerns that need to be treated on a case-by-case -case basis. And if we are serious about the rights of individuals, we owe it to all the persons involved and not just the new arrivals. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'd like to thank Justin for that rather heady argument, uh, making his case that elective abortion isn't murder. I was pretty sure I wouldn't be disappointed, and I wasn't. 
Uh, although I can appreciate the angle he put forth, I think it's flawed for at least two reasons. First, Justin claims that the thing that makes murder wrong is the desire not to be murdered, uh, whether it's a background desire or something more conscious. He argues that before a certain point in maturity, there is a time at which this desire has no possibility, even hypothetically, to obtain given the brain development. The argument, more or less, attempts to determine that point in maturity where the developing human in the womb cannot contest having its life taken, and that aborting it before this background desire has a chance to arise, taking its life isn't murder. I take issue with what amounts to be moving the goalposts in a self-serving and arbitrary fashion in order to justify allowing a mother to take the life of her child for the reasons women give for doing so. First, let me offer a pretty poor analogy. My wife likes to shop. A lot. She also likes to make returns. Uh, years ago, you could just walk up to a customer service counter and present the merchandise in new condition with tags still in place and they would just give you your money back. Then stores began adding other conditions. For example, uh, you needed the original sales receipt. Uh, then a time period was imposed uh, that returns needed to be made within 90 days or 60 or 30. And after a while, you needed to start showing a photo ID or driver's license. It seemed like the stores were adjusting the policy to make it more difficult to make returns. This is how I see defenders of abortion have operated over time. Decades ago, when abortion was first becoming an option for women, it was justified because, as far as we knew, the developing embryo was just a mass of tissue, not a baby, and not really alive, so to speak. So abortion was an amoral option. Then we gained a little more information, and we found out that there was more to it than just a mass of cells. We discovered that from pretty early on, it was actually alive. And so the justification for abortion had to adjust for that discovery. Don't worry, it's still okay to have an abortion, because even though it's alive, it's not like it's human or anything. Then uh, biology caught up even more, and it was discovered that not only was it alive, it was a genetically complete human being. And yet another adjustment had to be made. Uh, okay, it's alive, and technically it's human, but since we can't really be sure exactly when life begins, abortion is still an option, and you're not really doing anything wrong. But again, science made some more discoveries. Embryologists had discovered that from the moment of conception, it's alive and fully human. Not fully mature, but fully human. This forced abortion advocates and defenders to formulate yet another defense. Okay, well, sure, it's alive and it's human, but it's not really a person. And it's this personhood argument that it, attempting to differentiate between a person and a human being, this is only brought up in the context of abortion. It's only used to justify it. Uh, why is that? Why would we want to differentiate between human beings and human persons? Uh, I think it's because we all know intrinsically that killing a human being for the reason that women give for why they have abortions, we know it's wrong. And so, you see, these defenses for abortion thus far have primarily based, been based on ignorance of human embryology. And as this ignorance has become more informed, pro-choicers have had to become more sophisticated in their defenses for abortion. And I think that's where we are right now. This argument from desires is yet another sophisticated rationale designed to find permissible what should be impermissible, namely the intentional taking of a human life without proper justification. Through the decades, the pro-choice defenders have repeatedly moved the goalposts by shifting the standards that a developing human being had to meet in order to enjoy its right to life. The argument requiring the desire to not be murdered trades on raising the bar for the developing embryo in the womb to unattainable heights. Like when my oldest daughter holds a toy above her younger sister's head and tells her she can have it if she can reach it, now she knows full well she can't reach it. And it's in this way that requiring the desire to not be murdered is unreasonable. It requires an immature human to function and have the attributes of a mature human. That's hardly 
fighting fair. The second problem is that the desire to not be killed is irrelevant to whether a life that's taken is murder. The wrongness of killing something depends on what it is and why it's being killed. Uh, for example, we need no justification for killing an ant or a mosquito or a fly, uh, but we would need some justification for killing a dog or a cat. We would need even more justification for feeling the need to kill an endangered species, and we would need the highest standard of justification for killing another human being. They all have the innate desires to survive and not be killed, but we don't take those desires into account when contemplating whether or not we should or can kill them. What we do take into account is the kind of being it is, and that's how we determine the degree of justification we need to take its life. Elective abortion, for the reasons women give, do not meet that burden of justification and is therefore murder. What makes us all equal on an ontological level is the one and only property we all share equally. Our human nature. Every other property, every one of them is held in one degree or another. We all don't share the same desires or same degree of desires. Uh, we are all more or less intelligent than one another. Some of us have higher IQs. Some of us are stronger and more athletic. But we are all equally human, regardless of our weaknesses or disabilities. Knowing what we do about human development through embryology and biology is that from the moment of conception, we are fully human and unquestionably alive. This preempts any sliding scale of rationale which could be offered to try to disqualify from the get-go the weakest and most vulnerable from among us, from their right to life. There is no difference between a human being and a human person, except one can have its life taken at the will of its mother. So the more we try to rationalize and come up with justifications why we can take the life of a human being while it's in the womb, it just goes to support the position that we all know it's wrong deep down. Otherwise, we wouldn't need to justify taking it. We wouldn't need to come up with arguments for why we can take its life or why the mother has the right to do so. No one argues that a woman has the right to cut her own hair or clip her fingernails. But we do, for some reason, feel a need to argue for why she has the right to an abortion. So I'd like to conclude by reiterating that, instinctually, we all know we're taking the life of an innocent human being through abortion, and that's why we seek to justify the action in the first place. And with that, I'd like to yield back my time to my opponent. I want to first discuss John's rebuttal. John has two objections. His first objection is that I, with this argument and the others before it, are generally guilty of moving the goalposts. He finds an analogy in the seemingly arbitrary changes in the return policies of department stores. It seems these stores, he argues, were designing their policy to make it more difficult to make returns. I must say I share his frustration with these policies. And so in the same way, he calls my argument, quote, yet another sophisticated rationale designed to find permissible what should be impermissible. Now, I can't stop John from question-begging, and I can't stop John from attributing immoral motives to people or to everyone who has ever constructed and or presented an argument for the permissibility of abortion. I can only remind him that question-begging won't be taken seriously here, and that attacking the moral character of a person or of entire swaths of people, does not actually address the argument. The argument I presented and the arguments uh, that others have presented stand or fall on their own merits, regardless of thinly veiled ad hominem attacks. Even if I was a horrible person, my argument cannot be dismissed by this fact alone. John goes on. He says, quote, The argument requiring the desire to not be murdered trades on raising the bar for the developing embryo in the womb to unattainable heights. He says, quote, this is hardly fighting fair, unquote. John is clearly accusing me of something, of simply placing my marker where I find convenient and self-serving so that I can justify what he thinks I know deep down is actually murder. Unfortunately, this complaint completely ignores the fact that I devoted my entire opening statement to defending the distinctions I made by appealing to both common moral intuitions held by both sides and 
empirical findings of science. I find John's first objection to be very dismissive and frankly insulting. Let's now turn to his second objection. He says, quote, The desire to not be killed is irrelevant to whether a life that's taken is murder. The wrongness of killing depends on what it is and why it's being killed. And I agree. Of course the wrongness of killing depends on what it is, either in whole of its nature or in the properties that are parts of its nature. Remember, I argued in my opening statement that the property common to all instances of killing that are clearly morally wrong is the possession of an ideal background desire for a future like ours. An ideal background desire is a property. It tells you something about what the being is. Now the question of why something is being killed surely plays a role. After all, in certain legal contexts, a person can surrender their right to life by attacking another with perceived deadly force or by committing murder of their own. I, however, think capital punishment is a barbaric practice and should be seen as a source of embarrassment to any culture who legally sanctions such a thing. Now let's explore John's anti-abortion position. Does it hold weight? In his opening statement, John begins clarifying the issue of debate. He says the, the issue really is the moral permissibility of abortion in typical circumstances. Uh, he then goes on to preempt typical pro-choice arguments by correctly bringing up some of the more common pitfalls that plague such arguments. John also gives significant time to demonstrating that from conception, the zygote is alive and biologically fully human. Now, I could get nitpicky, but generally I have no issue with what John is saying here. And really, unless I'm woefully unfamiliar with other pro-choice advocates, nobody denies the fact that these are living, biologically human organisms. But as I said, it's entirely possible that I'm simply not familiar with some of the advocates that do hold such a position. The question then is, what if anything morally significant follows from that fact? It is not at all obvious that anything morally significant follows. The word human, of course, is a biological category and won't help us very much in a debate solely concerned with moral categories. In recognizing this, John goes on to claim that the reason abortion is morally wrong, is, is that it is murder, is because it violates our common human nature. For John, it is an organism's biological membership to a particular species of primate coupled with the essence or nature of that species that makes it wrong to kill such an organism. For John, the biological category of human just is a moral category in that it logically entails a right to life. Now, I have a problem with this. That a human has a right to life is not true by definition. Claiming that a right to life necessarily obtains within any biologically human organism requires an argument. Stretching a biological category, which used to mean mere species membership, to include the realm of moral values, needs some kind of justification. Unfortunately, an argument for this move is noticeably absent from his opening statement. But surely he knows that this is a major problem, facing all of those who wish to appeal to a species essence kind of argument. Again, they must say that there is something about being a member of a particular primate species, some undefined property common to all of the members of that species, that also entails a right to life. Whenever that undefined property is revealed, the consequences show themselves pretty clearly, and they're usually very unpalatable to the pro-lifer. So I asked John over email for his justification for extending the definition of human from mere biological category to also include moral significance. He replied that what is intrinsically morally significant about the human species is that, quote, we are light years above any other in intellect, emotion, reasoning, ingenuity, etc. We as a single species, he says, have dominated by leaps and bounds the earth and everything in it, unquote. Not finding this sufficiently clear, I attempted to interpret my opponent charitably. Perhaps John means something like, quote, they all possess an inherent capacity for deliberative thought, even if it may be underdeveloped or blocked at the moment, unquote. Which is something similar to what uh, Dr. Stephen D. Schwartz of the University of Rhode Island would argue. And John signs off on this clarification as being representative of his position. So the claim 
is that having a capacity for deliberative thought, something common to all members of the human species, is sufficient for having a more for having a right to life. Now, if that is true, it could potentially do the trick. It could make mere species membership include a moral truth, like a right to life, or as I call it, personhood. This, of course, would be the holy grail of pro-life arguments. Unfortunately for John, it isn't true. First, the idea that all humans have this capacity is simply false. Some humans are born with a brain that lacks even the capacity for sustaining deliberative thought, and yet they are still biologically human. Now, John might object and say that this is an example of the capacity being blocked. But, of course, if that's the strategy, then why can I not say, as Boonin argues, that any given animal, my goldfish, for example, is a person whose capacity for deliberative thought just happens to be blocked as well? If my goldfish had a bigger brain, then it would have the capacity for, delib for deliberative thought. Secondly, injuries happen. Humans can actually lose their capacity for deliberative thought with permanent damage to the higher brain regions. This suggests that humans can lose their right to life if they happen to fall from significant enough heights. And so, even if having the capacity for deliberative thought was sufficient for having a right to life, as John argues, it is still not true that mere species membership is sufficient. The man with brain damage is surely still biologically human. For my third point, why does the fact that something now has the capacity to be able to do something later limit the way that we can treat them now? This sounds suspiciously like treating potential properties as actual properties. And I can see no good argument for this. And so, at the end of the day, a being has a right to life because of its capacities and or properties, and not simply in virtue of its membership to a particular primate species. And so though he may try, my opponent cannot just arbitrarily expand a descriptive biological category as to include moral truths without taking on board some wildly objectionable consequences. Thank you. I'd like to make a, a quick clarification before proceeding. My argument was not an ad hominem, as Justin suggests. Rather, it was an attempt to show that the abortion choice advocates have a goal in mind, that is, to keep abortion morally acceptable. They were able to keep it acceptable using their defenses based on objections to the practice. As their defenses were in time refuted by medical science, they continued to shift the reason we should allow abortion, which shows they really weren't as concerned with the truth of what abortion does, which is taking the life of an innocent human being, as they were with preserving the legal ability to do so. Justin is simply mistaken that I am attacking his character, when in reality I am attacking his methodology, which is simply their latest rung on the ladder of the kinds of arguments employed for justifying abortion. The goal of abortion defenders has not been really to determine what's in the womb and what abortion does to it as much as they have been concerned with how to ensure women can still become not pregnant. Now, I'm not going to make a uh, complex philosophical argument as to why human beings hold a higher standing than others in the animal kingdom. In fact, I believe this is properly basic and is confirmed by our basic intuitions. Let me offer a couple brief examples to illustrate this innate knowledge. Uh, we all recognize that we do not hold animals to the same standards as humans. Animals steal from one another, they rape, they kill each other, and some cannibalize, and some even eat their own young. But we don't demand justice for the female of a species who's been forcibly copulated with, and we don't call the police when your son's hamster eats some of its offspring. These animals have desires to not be, have these things happen to them. However, we are morally repulsed when these things happen to people, but not the animals. This is because we intuitively know that our value is not determined by our desires and our abilities, and we have moral standing that no other creature does. The feelings we get when it's reported that someone has sex with a corpse, for example, which has no desires whatsoever, is nothing short of revulsion. We find it highly offensive when we hear about someone going through a dead man's pockets or taking a dead woman's jewelry from her at the scene of an accident. Why are we bothered by something like this? They no longer have the desire to not be stolen from. What's the problem? 
Likewise, think of the universal disgust that would be experienced if we were to hear of an elderly person who died from natural causes at their home, but uh, their family cut them into pieces and left them in the freezer for decades. They have no desires. Who cares, right? Lastly, and perhaps most pertinent to the discussion we're having right now, why do we find pictures of aborted fetal humans disturbing? Little fingers, arms and legs, a torso, a head sitting in little bloody pieces, that's cringe-inducing. Why is that? Because we all know that a person's value doesn't come from what they could do or what they can desire, how big they are or how mature they are. We know there is something sacred, for lack of a better term, about being a human being and even a lifeless human body that we seek to preserve its dignity. We all know it, it's morally wrong to take the life of an innocent human being without justification. We know it's murder regardless of the linguistic technicalities we create to stifle our conscience. Elective abortion is murder because of what it does and to whom it's done to. Intentionally taking the life of an innocent human being without proper justification is murder. Elective abortion intentionally takes the life of an innocent human being without proper justification. It follows naturally, therefore, that elective abortion is murder. Thank you very much for your time and listening to my, uh, my arguments on this issue. Remember that in my rebuttal I pointed out that one of his main objections was question begging and a veiled ad hominem attack. John did not object to my charge of question begging, but he did object to my claim that this was an ad hominem attack. So for those unfamiliar, an ad hominem is a logical fallacy, where one argues against their opponent's claim by referring to some irrelevant character trait of their opponent or opponents. Right? This is obviously fallacious because such a trait of a person or persons has really nothing to do with the actual soundness of the argument in question. Uh, now, John was submitting this goalpost-moving tendency as a reason for why the argument I presented ultimately fails. But of course, even if this claim was true, and I don't buy for one second that it is, this in no way invalidates my argument. Let's for a moment grant that the pro-choice movement wasn't ever really concerned with the truth of, of abortion, but that they're simply aimed at constructing arguments to ensure that it stays legal simply for matters of convenience or something. Let's assume that. John wants us to think that if that were true, that that would be a point against the validity of the argument I presented. But clearly, that is a fallacious inference. All that would mean is that pro-choicers are intellectually dishonest. It would have no, no bearing on the argument I present. I think that this is obviously an ad hominem attack, but I guess we will just have to disagree here and leave it up to the listeners to judge for themselves. I don't really know that pressing this much further is going to do that much good. Um, now, I also argued that John's second criticism of the argument I presented was based on a slight misunderstanding of the argument, and, Don, and John did not object to that. Uh, so now we can turn to John's case for why abortion is murder. So remember... John was originally arguing that abortion is wrong in virtue of the fact that we are all members of the human species, right? That we all have what he calls a human nature. He seems, he doesn't really seem to be interested in defending that further. Now John is arguing that it is because humans have a higher moral standing than other non-human animals, and that this fact is properly basic. Uh, Realize, though, that this claim isn't inconsistent with my argument. I could grant this premise and still show that his conclusion about abortion doesn't follow and that mine does. Now, in support of his claim, John appeals to certain intuitions, and I think that these are worth looking at because they do touch on the issue of abortion here. Uh, he points out that we are generally, dis generally disgusted at the idea of people having sex or stealing dead bodies, stealing things from dead bodies, right, even though these have no desires, uh, so first of all, I agree. People having sex with human corpses is revolting. I would also say that for dead non-human animals. My main concern here, though, is that I don't actually think that having sex with dead people is best understood as a moral issue, though. It is disgusting, but I don't really see it as a moral issue in and of itself. Um, obviously, it raises questions about the person's mental and social health uh, and their well-being and, and their care for personal hygiene. Insofar as those issues affect others, then I could see it becoming a moral issue. But I, I have no reason to see the act in and of itself as a moral issue. I hope that makes sense. Um, I also agree with John that taking items off a human corpse is wrong, though I think that that probably has something to do with the fact that we generally treat human corpses as the property of remaining loved ones 
uh, whether it be uh, keeping certain articles of clothing for remembrance or, or what have you. And obviously this would apply to the first case as well. Lastly, he gets back to the abortion issue. He asks why we find pictures of aborted human fetuses disgusting. But I think that this is clearly because for the same reasons we find blood and guts to be disgusting generally. There are good evolutionary reasons for finding these things revolting, but that is not a sufficient indicator of, of what things are morally permissible or impermissible. That, I think, is a very separate question. Uh, in this debate, I don't think that we've heard any good reasons for rejecting the argument I presented, and I also don't think that we've been given any good reasons to think that John's argument, or anything like it, could survive the objections raised. So if we are to make a decision based simply on the arguments given in this debate, I think it does seem pretty clear that we must conclude that the vast majority of abortions are not murder. I want to thank John, though, for voicing his interest in debating me on this very important issue, and I, I, and I want to thank him for a very lively exchange. Now, because John is a guest, I do want to offer him the opportunity to have the last word in this debate. Though I do want to be clear in that if any additional criticisms are brought up by John, I will not be addressing them here. Thank you. Since Justin has graciously offered me the opportunity uh, to take the final word, I'll take him up on that. Uh, the reason I didn't spend too much time in my responses addressing his arguments directly is because I actually addressed it in my opening speech, where I explained why relying on degree properties such as intellectual capacity is inadequate to justify the selective taking of some human beings' lives over others because we all hold these properties in different capacities and that the only way to truly decide whether or not killing one human being over another is morally wrong is to ground that investigation in an objective standard. In this case, the objective standard is, kill, is a human being's membership in the human family. I also offered uh, why that one's desires are irrelevant to whether or not killing them is murder. Moreover, my examples of uh, sexual behavior and desecration of dead bodies, you know, as... Uh, as absurd as they may have seemed, was to highlight that even in death, when the physical body has no desires whatsoever, we still recognize that even a lifeless human body deserves dignity. And we can see that treating a body with no desires with indignity is morally wrong, which leads to the conclusion that desires are irrelevant to the wrongness of certain behaviors. However, if Justin needs uh, further treatment of his argument, I can offer one more brief example before closing of why uh, desires are irrelevant. Uh, it is still morally wrong and murder to say, uh, shoot another person who wants to die. Or put another way, uh, if my friend were to confess to me his intentions to commit suicide, I would still be murdering him if I was the one who pushed him off the bridge to his death. A post-birth human being doesn't relinquish his rights to not be killed by another uh, just because they may not have the desire to not be killed, and neither does a pre-birth human being. And with that, I'd like to thank Justin for his invitation on debating the issue, Is Abortion Murder? And uh, I really appreciate that because this is an issue I feel very passionate about, and hopefully I've swayed some of the readers to think, uh, the listeners to think a little more carefully about their positions on abortion. Thank you. Okay, so that is the debate. Now, those of you familiar with the literature on this topic may recognize that the argument I presented in my opening statement uh, is, is nearly identical to the one David Boonin of the University of Colorado at Boulder presents in his excellent 2002 book titled A Defense of Abortion. And for those of you who are interested in pursuing this issue further, I would highly recommend that book as an essential starting point. Now, on a slightly lighter note, uh, Reasonable Doubts has been nominated for a podcast award by the good people of podcastawards.com. If you like the show and you feel that we deserve some kind of recognition for the work that we put into it, we really ask that you visit podcastawards.com and, and vote for us. Voting closes on November 15, but until then, you can vote once a day. And you can find us in the spiritual slash inspiration category. Now, I know many of our listeners enjoy Radiolab and Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, and they can be found under the science category, so make sure that you pick your favorite there as well. And that is it for now. Uh, we will be back soon with more episodes of Reasonable Doubts, your skeptical guide to religion. 
catch up on past Reasonable Doubts episodes or to email your questions or comments, check out www.doubtcast.org. Reasonable Doubts is a production of WPRR Reality Radio. You can find out more about Reality Radio at publicrealityradio.org. Reasonable Doubts theme music is performed by Love Fossil and used with permission.